All right, we're going to move into the next part of the unit, and we're going to start talking about circular motion. So we're going to actually start looking at things moving in a circular pattern. So this is a special case of 2D motion. We're going to take out a lot of the trig, though, and pretty much actually all of it's going to be taken out. So we're doing a simplified version of it. So the big things that we want to look at are things like uniform circular motion, planetary motion, and satellite motion, as well as a discussion on Kepler's law to kind of link everything together. So we're going to look at circular motion using Newton's laws of motion that we've learned already in this course. So with circular motion, you already have some degree of knowledge of it, maybe not explicitly in terms of physics equations and that, but you're used to things in traveling in circles, like a bike tire or a car tire if you're spinning something on a string. These are all examples of circular motion. So what we want to look at is things traveling in a circle. Now, in circular motion, what we're going to have is we're going to have an axis of rotation. So what we're saying is that all points on our object are going to rotate about this axis of rotation. For us, we are interested in a special case of uniform circular motion. So we are going to assume that the speed of rotation is constant. That will make life a little bit easier. As I mentioned, we're also going to restrict circular motion to two dimensions, or we're going to restrict it to a plane. And what that means is we're only going to have one axis of rotation. So we're not going to deal like, for example, if you had like a bike tire, we're just going to deal with like the actual tire itself rotating. We're not going to deal like if it's kind of like starting to wobble side to side, if it's processing, we're not going to deal with that. That's way too difficult for high school. So we're going to keep this in 2D just to make life simple. And as I said, we're going to eliminate pretty much all the trig. So when we look at circular motion, this is where we have to be a little bit more careful between that distinction between speed and velocity. So remember that speed is just the magnitude of how far you're going per unit time, whereas velocity measures your displacement per unit time, and it also has that direction added on there. So Newton's first law, as we learned in dynamics, it states that in the absence of a net force, an object is going to want to travel at constant velocity, which means it's going to travel in a straight line at a constant speed. And that's just consistent with the law of inertia. So an object will stay at constant velocity unless acted on by an unbalanced force. So when we have an object that's in circular motion, sometimes we'll talk about the velocity or we'll kind of phrase it as this instantaneous velocity. So the instantaneous velocity in a circle, in circular motion, it's always 90 degrees to the radial arm. So if we drew our velocity vector at any point in the circle, We'd want to draw that velocity vector at an angle of 90 degrees to the radius of that circle that joins this velocity vector. So no matter where we are in the circle, like let's say I was kind of down at this point here, this is my radial arm. I'd want to draw my velocity vector 90 degrees to that. So I might have something that looks a little bit like this. Now, the key thing is the magnitude of this velocity, the speed, that's not changing. But this is where we're going to start to lead into that distinction between speed and velocity and circular motion. So like I said, we're going to assume the speed's constant, but you'll notice that the direction is not constant. In fact, the direction's continuously changing. Like these two vectors here have the same length, which tells us the magnitude's the same, but they're clearly pointing in different directions. Like this vector's pointing directly to the right. This one is pointing slightly down and also to the right. So this is the big distinction in uniform circular motion. The speed is constant, which is important, and it's going to help us a lot. But velocity is not constant. It's continuously changing just because the direction is changing. That brings us up to an important point, and we're going to get to that in a moment. All you really need to know, though, with the velocity, at least in circular motion, besides how to calculate it, all you really need to know specifically with velocity is that its path is always tangent to the circle. Or sorry, the velocity vector is always tangent to the circular path. When we deal with circular motion, we're not going to be dealing with velocity. We're going to be dealing with speed pretty much exclusively, just because it's a lot easier and speed is really all we need. Now, because the velocity is changing, that direction's continuously changing, an object isn't just going to change direction on its own. Something has to cause that to happen. So if we have a change in velocity, this means we have to have an acceleration present. And if we have an acceleration present, we know by Newton's second law, the net force equals mass times acceleration. If there's an acceleration, we also have to have a net force. So let's talk a little bit more about this acceleration.
we know by definition that the acceleration is just going to be the change in velocity divided by the change in time. But let's focus at the change in velocity. That's the big part we want to focus on. So I have this diagram here. It's showing the velocity of a pebble stuck in a wheel at two different points. So again, very important to note, these two vector lengths here, they are the same length. They're just pointing in different directions. So we have the point we have the pebble at this point A and then sometime T later we have it at this point B. Now when we're dealing with change in velocity we could say that that's the velocity at B minus the velocity at A and that works really good but in kinematics when we did a lot of vectors we said we would prefer more to add vectors so instead of saying VB minus VA we could say that this is the velocity at B plus the negative at VA so if I look at my two vectors here, here's VA, here's VB. So if I'm adding these vectors, VB is going to be unchanged. But to this, we're going to add the negative of VA. All that means is we're going to switch the arrowhead. So the arrowhead being here is going to go down here. And then we're going to move the tail of that vector over to this point. So what we're going to get is we're going to get something that looks a little bit like this. Now what's important to note is where that change in velocity is pointing. If you don't see it, that's okay. The diagram is not particularly the greatest, but you should notice that that change in velocity, it happens to be pointing towards the center of the circle. And the key is that no matter where you look at the change in velocity along the circle, it will always point towards the center. And that's the important bit here. So that's gonna lead us to this special term. So this type of motion, this is going to be referred to as centripetal motion. Centripetal is just a fancy Latin word meaning center seeking. So in this case, the acceleration seeks out the center of the circle. So because that acceleration, or sorry, because that change in velocity is directed towards the center of the circle, that tells us that our acceleration is directed towards the center of the circle, and also our net force is gonna be directed towards the center of the circle. So this special acceleration directed towards the center of the circle this is what we refer to as centripetal acceleration. The net force that's directed towards the center of the circle, this is what we refer to as the centripetal force. And we're gonna look at these in a lot more depth. So just before we get into those a little bit later in terms of the depth, I just want to address a very common misconception. So a lot of times when we talk about circular motion, the big, terms that come, the big term that comes up is this thing called centrifugal force. So centrifugal, also another Latin word, it means center fleeing, so it's trying to get away from the center. And the thing is, centrifugal force isn't real. It's what we call a pseudo force. People think it's real, but it's not actually real. People kind of use it to explain phenomena that have actual proper physics explanations for them happening. So for example, a little bit earlier in the course, we talked about, when we talked about Newton's first law, we talked about if you have a, you know, a driver and a passenger in a car, and let's say that the car, it takes a sharp right turn, the passenger is gonna to move towards the driver. Now, the passenger may feel like they're being pushed towards the driver, so they might say they're experiencing a centrifugal force, but we talked that the reason that's happening is because the, dri or the passenger's body, it wants to continue in a straight line consistent with Newton's first law. It wants to continue going straight, but as the car is turning, that version of going straight ends up going right into the driver. So using centrifugal force is a lazy way of explaining it. It's incorrect. There is an actual proper physics explanation for that. And that's where we talk about, again, the body obeying Newton's first law. Another common example where we have that misconception, if I take something on a string, like let's say I have a yo-yo on the string and I start twirling it around in a circle, I might feel that yo-yo pulling on me and then I might want to say, oh, that's the centrifugal force pulling on me. Once again, that's being lazy. There is a valid explanation. We also know from dynamics, if I'm applying a force on that string in order to get that yo-yo to move in a circle, I'm pulling on the yo-yo. We know by Newton's third law, the yo-yo is also going to pull back on me with equal force in opposite direction. So we can, again, explain this phenomena using an actual law of physics. We're not going to default to this lazy, incorrect position of centrifugal force. So be really careful with that term. In fact, I would just abandon it entirely. 
The last thing is a lot of people think centripetal force is this special force that at, gets added on a free body diagram. Centripetal force is not anything special. Centripetal force is just another way of saying net force. We usually use FC instead of F net in the context of circular motion just to emphasize that we are dealing with circles. But we'll get into that a little bit more later as we start to do some problems. But this is just kind of your gentle introduction to circular motion. We'll actually start to delve deeper into it in a little bit.